let's go to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are not as common as pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, but their numbers are increasing. And one of the reasons is we have now patients who have risk factors, and, you know, especially MEN syndrome or VHL, these, you know, incidents, we are detecting more of these young adults and kids who are high risk of developing pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and, you know, the most majority, like 70% are sporadic, so we don't know who to screen for, but we can screen in this 10 to 30% of patients who might have high risk. So that's where screening is currently offered. The good news is with curative resection, patients do very well, more than 15% survival. Even with metastasis, they do pretty well after a treatment. So the biology is much more favorable, and I think it comes back to why Steve Jobs did much better than Patrick Swayze because the biology is more favorable. Now, these are the two survival curves. This is the data from my previous institution at MGH. What you can see is there are clear 10-year overall survival benefit in patients who have been operated versus those who are not been operated. So that tells you why we resect all neuroendocrine tumors, if, even if when they are asymptomatic, if you incidentally detect, which is majority of neuroendocrine tumor these days, we detect them on imaging. So tumor, they are still resected, but not the small one, less than two centimeter size tumor don't have as much benefit, survival benefit. So in less than two centimeter tumor, if incidentally detected in older adults, those are ones that are followed. Now, what are the imaging features? Now, our traditional textbook have taught us that neuroendocrine tumors tend to be hypervascular. That is true in functioning tumors. Functioning tumors tend to be small. They are hypervascular and their metastases are also hypervascular. So when you are detecting functioning tumor, you need to be diligent, both with your protocol as well as search pattern, because they can be multifocal, they are tiny, they could be less than one centimeter, and they, they can have symptoms. So it's critical that you have a diligent search pattern in patients who have high risk for neuroendocrine tumor, including VHL or MEN patients. Majority of patients actually are non-functioning. I would say 60 to 70 percent of neuroendocrine tumors fall in a non-functioning category, and these are either incidentally detected or due to the mass effect, the large size, or local invasion or metastasis, we might see them. And what you notice here is these tumors tend to be more heterogeneous. They tend to be larger. They need, tend to have cystic changes or necrosis, and some can masquerade as a primary cystic tumors of the uh, pancreas. Now, since they are malignant, they are all resected, whether you call them MCN or you call them neuroendocrine tumor, they are taken out. So as long as you don't call them uh, pseudocyst of the pancreas. So that's majority are. Now, they are locally invasive, so vascular structure involvement. They go to lymph nodes first, and the metastasis can go to liver. Peritoneal mets or distant mets are otherwise uncommon in the non-functioning tumors. Now, the question is, does the benefit of surgery extend to all types of tumor? Because we are picking a lot of these. And what we learn from the same data, actually, if the tumor is under one centimeter and patient has no symptoms, the survival benefits between operated and non-operated is not much. When we go to under two centimeters, kind of a similar trend. Once the lesion go more than two centimeter and three centimeter, then there is a differences in the survival. So based on this, the new guidelines suggest neuroendocrine tumor when incidentally detected, and if they are less than two centimeter size, they are biopsied initially because we can't say on imaging 100% they are neuroendocrine and then they are followed with imaging. We don't resect them uh, less than two centimeter tumor. Now our job is not only detecting these lesions but also making sure they, we characterize the masquerading lesions. One of the common area for neuroendocrine tumor, incidental tumor is body and tail of the pancreas where we can have intrapancreatic spleen or splenule, whatever we you want to call it. They can be hypervascular, as we know, splenic tissue can be. And I think you need to always question yourself if this lesion is spleen, splenule or it's a neuroendocrine tumor, you want to save patient biopsy because, you know, 
biopsying a tail lesion through en endoscopy is not that easy. And how do you characterize? We all know. Splenule follow the enhancement pattern of spleen on CT. This can be tougher on dual energy CT. It's much easier on material density iodine. You can see it's exactly similar distribution of iodine. But MR is diagnostic. We do rarely do nuclear medicine studies to characterize splenule. In MR, you have all sig uh, uh, signal characteristics on all sequences. Splenule follows that of a spleen. And I'm sure most of you will have no challenge uh, in characterizing those. But you need to be careful. Sometime in your mind, you might think you are dealing with splenule. And, and taking a more diligent approach is important. Other lesion that can be hypervascular are metastasis from renal cell carcinoma occasionally very small um, microcystic neoplasm or sponge variety uh, of microcystic neoplasm can masquerade as a neuroendocrine tumor um, on and MR is pretty classic there especially the delayed phase images and T2 weighted images now this is what you need to be careful uh, you know this is a patient who had some symptoms a lesion was detected in the tail of the pancreas it was considered like, you know, exercise spleen or intrapancreatic spleen because on CT it looks similar to spleen. MR was done. MR, you can see the signal doesn't match that of a spleen. Uh, even on uh, T2 weighted images, it doesn't match exactly. There is more heterogeneity and on enhancement, it enhances different. So MR is always much better than CT. Whenever in doubt, you should get an MR. And this is, was indeed a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. So as long as you know that you need to characterize the lesion which might masquerade as a neuroendocrine tumor uh, but also being diligent.